And this is Paul talking to the Corinthian Christians. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there, are, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another one gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats, or eats bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, they will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give you some further direction. Now initially, although 1 Corinthians 11 gives the appearance of issuing directives, and this is certainly the traditional way that this been, the church has read it, it's really about worship. It's about our attitude as the body of Christ in worship, and the way that we consider the activity of worship as a, a corporate activity, and not as a personal fulfilment time. Another problem that's developed in the church today, as, as was the case in the first century, is the selective reading or, and the application of a text which is neither honest or real. So rather than go down a rabbit hole and look at different issues, I want us to understand that all of it's tied to a, a bigger discussion. But the concern is that we show some integrity when we're dealing with what have become major issues that really aren't really important after all. What we need to do is understand worship. It's not about what we do, it's about who we are in worship that really matters. Another useful piece of information is that Paul is responding to 1 Corinthians and what he's doing is responding to their questions. Now we don't have their questions here, all we have is the answers that he's given. So it's a bit like a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Because actually, if we knew what the questions are, we can make perfect sense of this. And I suppose that's why we're always tussling this one about. And this means that we have to be very, very careful to consider the context of what we're studying without compromising its original meaning in order to make an appropriate application to our today situation. Now, if we can grasp that, then true liberty can be experienced. So if we're talking about worship. I was uh, doing a bit of reading of some of the stories, uh, and one of them came up was a, a dad who said to his, his son, it's your birthday coming up, what would you like? And he said, well, I don't know, Dad. And his dad was expecting, because the boy was normally very particular, he was expecting to say, well, I'd like a baseball, you know, and um, baseball set, and it's an aisle six in Toys R Us, you know, and he would tell him where it was going to be, or he'd like a chess set, and that was between, in alphabetical order between this game and that game, you know. But the boy said, oh, I just don't know. And he said, well, what do you think he would like? And he said, um, maybe a ball. And he said, okay, what sort of ball would you like then? Would you like a, a football? I mean a rugby ball, that's a football, okay? Or a soccer ball, one of them round things, okay? And he says, well, I don't know. I tell you what, he says, if you're going to spend time playing with me, Dad, then I want a football or rugby ball so we can throw it to each other. If you're not going to have time, I'll take a soccer ball because then I can go and play with the boys on the street. 
So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll surprise you. And the boy went away, he was quite happy. And later on, he was talking to his wife, and they, they, just, they realised, actually, that their son wasn't so much worried about the gift that he was going to receive, they were more interested, he was more interested in the giver of the gift. You see, this is what worship is about. Yes, we celebrate the gift of life at communion as we break the bread, but our worship is directed at the giver, so worship is an attitude, as, it's not something that just happens on a Sunday. And of course this is a worship time and an opportunity for us to focus on the Lord together. In this sense, what we're doing is corporate worship. And I think it's, it's interesting that the New Testament never refers to the gathering of believers as an act of worship. Did you notice that? And I think that's done deliberately. Because if we fall into the mistake of equating worship with what we habitually do on a Sunday or in some kind of meeting, then actually we miss the meaning of it. In the New Testament, worship is a matter of spirit and truth. It's an integral part of our heart. It's about where we, where we operate and how we operate in those circumstances. So your first heading, if you want it this morning, is the heart of worship. The heart of worship, right? The heart or the essence of worship is the inner experience of treasuring the beauty and the worth of God. And the outward forms of worship that we've been developing down the centuries are those performances that demonstrate how much we treasure the beauty and the worth of God, who through Jesus Christ has demonstrated his love for us in the gift of salvation, and by his Holy Spirit grants and sustains spiritual life within the human frame. And that is a miracle in itself, isn't it? Now because of this, each one of us has the capacity and the ability, now very important words, capacity and ability, ability, very important words, so we can worship God, another two good words, creatively and distinctively. Isn't that great? It makes it individual, but it makes it corporate at the same time. Do you see that? And I think it's just beautiful. In fact, this is where the English language really works, okay? So we have the capacity and the ability to worship God creatively and distinctively with our own individual personalities. So, if there are 100 people attending the service here, then actually there's 100 entry points into worship. And our sovereign God is able to sort all of those out to feel the expression of every heart and every single one and more. And it's God's desire that in relationship to him, our being should be absolutely consumed with his presence, not in some unrealistic way where he smothers us, but in a manner that enables us to live a full life well as individuals and as a body. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That's the grounding of worship. Whatever you do, in other words, wherever you are, whatever you do, demonstrate that God is alive and that you treasure him in your heart. That is a real challenge to every single one of us, isn't it? It's a challenge right to the Christian church and right to the core business there. It changes everything, what we think, where we go, the decisions we make. Everything should re reflect the worship of God. Now, you know, if we were to do a straw poll of our neighbours of our workmates, of the places we visit regularly, of the community here in Beacon Loft even. What would they say about us? Do they see God in our dealings with them? What's it Paul says to the Colossians? I love this passage. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God's not calling you to be some kind of holy willy, you know, who puts on this pretense and this big smile. He's talking about you being the real you that you are meant to be in worship. You know, if we were going to a sporting event or to a concert, what would be the best seats? Have you noticed that when you go into a concert? That you, go on, you can go online now and you can actually choose your seats. If you go to the pictures, you can do that. Now they turn it around and say, where would you like to sit, sir? And I know exactly the best place in the cinema, so I always say, I want that seat. 
If you're in a concert, maybe it's centre stage or front row. But I'll tell you something, when it comes to a Sunday morning service, no one sits in the front row. I do. <laughs> there are exceptions, of course. <coughs> but just, as if to burst your bubble, regardless where you sit in church, everyone gets a front seat in church. Everyone is in the presence of God. It doesn't matter where you sit. And of course we can see God in our everyday lives. We can see him in nature. We can see him in everyday events in our life. We should be looking to see God all around us and all in all these events. But here, as a church, this is where we get the best view of God. And here, we get a better view. This is where all the distractions and all the obstacles in our life should take the back seat. While our relationship with God takes a front seat, we meet him together. In the gathered life of the church, the communion meal has produced for us a point of focus where we gather around the Lord's table. This belongs to him. It's free from man's judgment or rule. And as we are here together, our focus is free from all that judgment is drawn to him who is the head of the table. And this is a time of reflection. We have the opportunity to remember, remember this. Because of Jesus, we have new life. Because of Jesus, we have the whole new family. And because of Jesus, we have a wealth of experience that without him we would never have had. If there is splendor in our worship then we will truly bask in the glory and beauty of God and the richness of his goodness and grace that actually he's lavished on us. We talked about it already. How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. Marva Dawn, brilliant writer, she says, Worship that immerses us in the splendor of God's shalom and creation design will give us a vision of much better practices for living. Songs and texts and preaching and prayers will help us to form us into the peacemakers and justice builders we're meant to be, into chaste friends and faithful lovers. <coughs> Worship that resists the cry for instant gratification, moreover, <coughs> contributes to the building of these virtues. You know, we can be so much more, but our worship around his table takes us beyond ourselves. Sure, it's good for us as individuals to worship, but it is together as a body that we come. And we need to move away from the notion that intimacy with God is something that is cosy and depends on some kind of sentimental approach. Because all that happens is that those who don't experience the same feelings are distanced. And we miss the point of public celebration, which is designed for all believers to enter, regardless of age or gender or social status. You know, we, we should worship him with every ounce of respect and reverence that we can muster because, you know, he's the king of the universe. But at the same time, we've got to remember that he's our father. That he wants a warm, he wants a close and loving relationship with us. And I recognize that there has to be a balance here. And the trouble is we have a, a problem with that, don't we? But if our relationship with him is right, and by this I mean in our whole being, physical and spiritual, then we will find a level or a balance at which we can operate in a full way. You see, worship that has as its focus participation in God will actually welcome in and develop the communion of saints as the true community that is created in the image of God who is completely rela relational. If we were to look back, you know, in the earlier verses, we would actually see the functional submission in the Godhead that regards every person in the Godhead as equal. Now, in the same way, the church is to express these qualities in community, to understand that all of us are on level ground. That God has called us to be his children and all of us mean exactly the same and are valued exactly the same. This means that we don't have to go it alone. We don't have to distance ourselves. We have a responsibility and a duty to give and give and give to the body of Christ. Because to fail in this area is to deny our, our identity as a child of God and that is not worship. What does Paul say? 
1 Corinthians 10, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. When he wants you to get away from something, Paul says flee from it. Run away from it. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break a participation. Oop, say it again. It's not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. See that is the heart of worship. Secondly. The meal that challenges believers to reality. You know, I read a lovely story of a man called Pat Novak. He's um, a hospital chaplain. And it tells the story of John. He was a man in his 60s who hadn't responded to any treatment. Medical tests, psychological tests had been clear. Um, he hadn't been able to swallow for weeks and he was just wasting away. The medics did all they could... And finally, and as, a, as someone who's been a hospital chaplain, I understand this perfectly well, after they'd done everything, they called the chaplain's office. Things are desperate, Padre, would you come? You know, I've heard that so many things. So, so the chaplain went into the room, and poor old John was sitting there, and he just fading away. And of course, as chaplain, certainly in his case, he wasn't allowed to offer communion or, or talk directly about the gospel. But he said to the guy... Um, would you like to take communion? And John, this guy was dying, broke down. I can't, he says. I've sinned and I can't be forgiven. Well, Pat took some time. He explained to him that actually his sins could be forgiven. And he led him to the Lord. He went out and he got some he went to the canteen and bought a, a roll and he got some fruit juice and all sorts of things and he took it in and he broke bread with John for the first time. And it was the first time in weeks that he'd been able to take solid food into his mouth even. He took the cup and he swallowed and within three days he walked out of hospital. And the nurses were so amazed that they sent it to the local paper and the article, and I've got a copy of the article which was actually published in a local paper. This is the power of worship. The power of the table. There's no magical power in the elements themselves. But the meal is simply a graphic means of helping us to see God. And this is so different from our society in which we live with. It's advertising that plays on our fears and our desires. You know, the stuff they throw at us through the telly, it doesn't really make any sense, does it? Do you remember that Levi's outfit? And you still, I still can't try to work it out. And there was this young couple running in these pair of Levi's and they were running through walls. And then they were running along the side of a building with trees growing out the building. What was that about? I still haven't got it. There's another one, um, a cat that flies through walls. Have you seen that one? Like something doing cat food. I mean, I still don't get it. And what about the Lynx advert? How many young blokes have I known who bought <laughs> Lynx because they're going to attract the girls? <laughs> Have you seen the bloke on the beach? He goes, and suddenly all the girls come to him. And you know, they all look like models on this beach, don't they? Wake up and smell the coffee. Most folk are as ugly as we are. What about the car adverts and all these clever jingles and all the, all the extra bits about them? They make you feel a feeling of sophistication. Do you know, I'm sure they develop car colours to make you feel like you're sophisticated. You know, I saw a lovely Audi, and I'm not in, really into cars, but I saw this lovely Audi the other night, and it, the, it was this grey colour, and it was just something about it, it was a quality about this colour and the tinted windows that made you feel, I said to Mary, that's a lovely car. She's talking about cars, you know, but... But what about the cabin space? What about the size of the engine? What about size of the tyres that you're going to have to buy, you know? Or, you know, how easy is it to change a headlight bulb? They never tell you that sort of thing, do they? How unfortunate it is, though, that the Christian church has brought into this same culture of the soundbite that preaches in doctrinal statements, attacking everyone and winning no one, and then announces to the world around, believe in this particular way and you will be saved. Now, we know Jesus is the only way. I'm not saying that. But the trouble is, 
sometimes it comes across in such a negative way. And when you question these people about the theological validity of their approach, the simple response is a firm belief in compromise by association. If you don't believe in this particular way, then you don't fit the bill. It's a lot of nonsense, isn't it? God never intended for us to come into a relationship with him and kiss our brains goodbye. He's made us unique and gifted and creative. You know, in Acts chapter 2, listen to this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why did that happen? Why doesn't that happen after our communion service here on a Sunday? I'll tell you what was happening. The apostles were talking about real life, just as we're talking about real life. He was, they were helping them to engage in the stuff of life and actually be the best that they could be. They took them into the presence of God. They were seeing the king of the universe on a table. They were seeing the great sacrifice that he'd made on their behalf and they understood their position in that. Do we? Do we understand the privilege that we have of being brought into the presence of God? And as they understood it and as they got it, God, by his Holy Spirit, revealed himself in the miracles that were happening around them. Now, we're not told whether that was people growing arms and legs or whatever it was. We don't know. It could have been simple things. People come from abject poverty, suddenly realizing that they come, they were blossoming as real people. That's a miracle in itself, isn't it? What about that man John I was telling you about? That was a miracle, wasn't it? I'm not discounting real miracles because they do happen. I know they do. I've seen them. I've experienced them. But the fact is, God was revealing himself to them and then they understood that everything else that they had was of secondary importance. All the stuff they had in their garage didn't belong to them anymore. And actually, having six different kinds of spanners in your box doesn't put food on someone's table. So they went and sold the extras. And the local people all around them who would have been pretty empty at one stage were suddenly saying there's something different about these people and they earned their favour. People wanted to know them. But people understood that if you wanted to be a Christian, it was a serious business. And loads of people would have been on the fringes all the time, wanting to know more, but not quite being there. But the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, by the time the church had developed in Corinth, there was a plethora of people in the church from so many different backgrounds. And the problem was, they didn't cope with it very well. And quickly they moved into a routine and they became as secular as the world around them. Even the breaking of bread service was lost in the behaviour of the wealthy because they would hold a banquet, you see. And then sometimes they even divided the congregation up by social status. And they would gorge themselves on food and drink. And by the time the poor of folk arrived, folk arrived, there was very little, if anything, left. And the Apostle Paul rebuked them over this. And he pointed out that this was making a mockery of the gospel they say they believed. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This isn't of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. Because we, we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that amazing? God has got it all in hand. And at this point in the history of the church, they weren't referred to as Christians. They actually never had a name. They were described by what was happening to them, by what was happening in them, and by what was happening through them. And I wonder, could that be the same set of us? The demonstration we have at this table is so different. Here we see God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit in all his glory. 
We, he, we see his sovereignty as the author of salvation. We see his compassion. We see his mercy. We see his grace. We see the integrity of his sacrifice because he is true to his word in as much as he would never ask us to do something he wasn't prepared to do himself. That's how far God is prepared to go. How far are you prepared to go? We, just, we see this power in the way that the simplicity the meal speaks of it binds us together and it's meant to spur us onto service. I saw Jesus last week. He was wearing blue jeans and an old shirt. He was in the church building. He was alone and working hard. For just a moment, he looked like one of our church members. Huh, but it was Jesus, all right. I could tell by his smile. I saw Jesus last Sunday. He was teaching a Bible class. He didn't really talk loud or use long words, but. You could tell he believed what he said. For just a minute, he looked like the Sunday school teacher. Ah, but it was Jesus. I could tell by his loving voice. I saw Jesus yesterday. He was at the hospital visiting a friend who was sick. They prayed together quietly. For just a minute, he looked like Brother Jones. But I could tell it was Jesus. I could tell by the tears in his eyes. I saw Jesus this morning. He was in my kitchen making my breakfast and fixing me a special lunch. For just a minute, he looked like my mum. But it was Jesus. I could feel the love from his heart. I see Jesus everywhere, taking food to the sick, welcoming others into his home, being friendly to a newcomer. And for just a minute, I think it's someone I know, but it's always Jesus. I can tell by the way that he serves. May someone see Jesus in you today. Who we are as the people of God, it does make a difference. How we worship as the people of God, it really makes a difference. The communion meal brings us to the essence of worship. And do you know something? It confirms that we're not alone. That we are members of the body of Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your body, the church. We thank you that you've called us to be one and to enter into your presence and know the glory of your being. And we thank you that we can come as ordinary folk, as the one loaf, knowing that we are there to be broken if necessary. Inspire us, we pray, by your sacrifice. Inspire us by your love and your life too and help us to be the very best we can be. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen.